Chapter 1. The easiest way to get through life is to understand that you can't please the world. For so long, Glennon Doyle listened to the expectations of the world. All she heard was voices telling her to be smart, beautiful, and happy. All she did was try to live her life according to the rules set by men. She wanted other things, but was too scared to let it show for fear of being criticized and cast out. Glennon Doyle, married to her ex-husband, had found herself in love with a woman. She tried to suppress that feeling, sticking with her ex-husband despite their issues. Until one day, she heard a voice inside that told her that woman she loved was who she was meant to be with. This voice drew her out of her societal pleasing ways, and that was the beginning of her many rebellious acts to society. That also was the beginning of countless pangs of inner peace. Glennon Doyle tells her story and tells us to embrace our true self against all odds. For only when we love ourselves can we take on any challenge the world may throw our way. Chapter 2. Find True Direction by Staying Calm and Listening to the Knowing Glennon Doyle was on her societal-pleasing journey when one day the popular Bible verse, Be Still and Know, flashed through her mind. This time, however, it struck her differently. It suggested a different approach to knowing. Just stop. Stop moving. Stop talking. Stop searching. Stop panicking. Stop flailing. If you just stop doing, you'll start knowing. While that seemed to her like magical nonsense, her desperate self was willing to try it out. So one day, during the kids' school hours, she locked herself in her closet, closed her eyes, and did nothing but breathe. At first, it was somewhat difficult to focus, but after a few weeks, she could feel herself drop lower during each closet session. She didn't stop there. She sank deeper, deep enough to find a new level inside her where all she could hear was her breath. There, in the deep, did she sense something deep inside her, a knowing. It was from that moment her life changed. In order to rise, you have to sink first. Search for and depend upon the voice of inner wisdom instead of outer voices of approval. Learn to take orders only from your own knowing. Whenever you're presented with a work, personal or family decision, whether big or small, sink. Whenever uncertainty arises, sink. Sink beneath the swirling surf of words, fear, advice, and conditioning, and feel for the knowing. While embracing your own knowing, know that the knowing doesn't reveal a five-year plan. It's a loving, playful guide that only reveals the next right thing. So you need to form a close bond with your knowing and learn to trust each other. Did you know the reason we say to people, calm down, is because beneath the noise of the pounding, swirling surf is a place where all is quiet and clear. Chapter 3. Find your peace by always listening to your knowing. The knowing guides you toward the next right thing. It feels like warm liquid gold filling the veins and solidifying enough just to make its recipient feel steady and certain. When you let the knowing guide you, you don't need to seek approval from any other person. You don't even need permission, and that is such a grown-up way to live. Another good part of communicating with your knowing is that there are no language barriers. The knowing is beyond and beneath language, so you have no language to use to translate it to anyone. Since the knowing doesn't use words to explain itself to you, you do not have to use words to explain yourself to the world. This is the most revolutionary thing a woman can do, doing one thing at a time without asking permission or offering any explanation. This way of life is thrilling, and it's less deceptive because, ideally, no one else in the world knows what you should do. Experts don't know. 
ministers, therapists, magazines, and authors, none of them know. Not even your closest friends and family know. No one, in actuality, has ever lived or will ever live this life you're trying to live, with your gifts, challenges, past, and people. Every life is an unprecedented experiment. Recognize the fact that your life is yours alone, so stop following set standards. It's like asking people for directions to places they've never been. They will lose you. Always remember that in this world, there is no map. We are all pioneers here. So when a moment of uncertainty arises, breathe, turn inward, and sink. Find the knowing. Do the next thing it nudges you toward and let it stand without any explanation whatsoever. Continue to shorten the gap between the knowing and the doing for the rest of your life and you'll always find peace. Chapter 4. To live life to its full extent, live up to your imagination. There is a life meant for you that is truer than the one you're living. But in order to have it, you will have to forge it yourself. You will have to create on the outside what you're imagining on the inside. Only you can bring it forth, and it will cost you everything. Glennon Doyle There are women who harbor achy, heavy hunches that their lives, relationships, and world are meant to be more beautiful than they are. Shouldn't my marriage feel more loving than this? Shouldn't my religion be more alive and kind than this? Shouldn't my work be more meaningful and my community be more connected? Shouldn't the world I'm leaving to my babies be less brutal? Isn't it all just supposed to be more beautiful than this? How can a woman move from feeling discontent to creating a new life, a new world? How can a woman begin to live from her imagination rather than from her indoctrination? If you want to hear the voice of imagination, you must speak to it in the language it understands. If you want to know who you were meant to be before the world told you who to be, if you want to know where you were meant to go before you were put in a cage, if you want to taste freedom instead of control, then you must relearn your soul's native tongue. All women are bilingual. We all speak the language of indoctrination, but our native tongue is the language of imagination. When a woman uses the language of indoctrination, should and shouldn't, right and wrong, good and bad, she activates her mind. This training in the long run pollutes her mind. In order to get beyond your training, you need to activate your imaginations. A woman's mind is an excuse maker. Her imaginations are storytellers. So instead of asking yourself what's right or wrong, ask yourself what is true and beautiful. Do this and watch your imagination rise inside you. There is no one way to live, love, raise children, arrange a family, run a school, a community, a nation. The norms were created by somebody, and each of us is a somebody. You are somebody and can make your own normal. You can throw out all the rules and write your own. You can build your life from the inside out. So stop asking what the world wants from you. Instead, ask yourself what you want for your world. Chapter 5. Build a new world by letting the old one burn. When a woman lets herself feel, her inner self transforms. When she acts upon her knowing and imagination, her outer worlds transform. This should tell you that living from the world within you will change your outer world. However, if you want to build a new world, you must be willing to let the old burn. You must be committed to holding up to nothing but the truth, knowing that if the truth inside you can burn a belief, a family structure, a business, a religion, or an industry, it should have become ashes yesterday. Your life, family, and world become truer versions of themselves if you feel, know, and imagine. It can be very scary at first, 
Because once you feel, know, and dare to imagine more for yourself, you can't unfeel, unknow, or unimagine. There is no going back. You are launched into the abyss, the space between the not-true-enough life you're living and the truer one that exists only inside of you. So you might be tempted to say, maybe it's safer to just stay here. Even if it's not true enough, maybe it's good enough. But good enough is what makes people drink too much and snark too much and become bitter and sick and live in quiet desperation until they lie on their deathbed and wonder, what kind of life might I have lived if I'd been braver? Just as rebirth means death, the building of the true and beautiful means the destruction of the good enough. Once a truer, more beautiful vision is born inside you, life is in the direction of that vision. At this point, holding on to what is no longer true enough is not safe. It's the riskiest move because it is the certain death of everything that was meant to be. Know that your next life will always cost you this one. If you want to truly live, be ready to constantly lose who you just were, what you just built, what you just believed, and what you just knew to be true. Only on the destruction of the old can the foundation of the new be laid. Chapter 6 Men are as human as women and should be allowed to live freely. You'd think women are the only ones cheated out of living up to their true selves. Boys are not allowed to be whole either. They are in cages too, and this affects them psychologically. From time to time, we hear heart-wrenching news headlines like middle school gay boy had hung himself because of bullying at school, or a 35-year-old decorated veteran had just succumbed to PTSD. These are some of the implications of making boys try to comply with our culture's directions and expectations. Boys are trained to believe that the way to become a man is to objectify and conquer women, value wealth and power above all, and suppress any emotions other than competitiveness and rage. Everything that makes a boy human is a real man's dirty secret. Culture has made some innate masculine traits feminine. Traits like mercy, tenderness, softness, quietness, kindness, humility, uncertainty, empathy, connection. Men are told, don't be these things because these are feminine things to be. Be anything but feminine. The gag is there is no such thing as a feminine quality because there's no such thing as masculinity or femininity. Femininity is just a set of human characteristics a culture pours into a bucket and slaps with the label feminine. Human qualities are not gendered. What is gendered is permission to express certain traits. This society discredits all tenderness and mercy as feminine because disallowing the expression of these qualities is the way the status quo keeps its power. In a culture as imbalanced as ours, in which a few hoard billions while others starve, in which children are shot and killed while gun manufacturers and politicians collect the blood money, mercy, humanity, and vulnerability cannot be tolerated. Mercy and empathy are great threats to an unjust society. Do not be part of this misogynistic culture. Boys are just as human as girls. They need permission, opportunities, and safe places to share their humanity. Endeavor to encourage real, vulnerable conversations among your sons and their friends. Ask about their feelings, relationships, hopes, and dreams so they don't become middle-aged men who feel permitted to discuss only sports, sex, news, and the weather. When they cry, don't stop them or shame them. Let's help our boys become adults who don't have to carry life alone. If men can greatly and consistently express the pain of being human, then violent release won't be their go-to option. 
The world will be a better place if men are freely allowed to reclaim their full humanity. Chapter 7 Don't be so conscious of racism that you lose yourself. One issue that fuels worldwide unrest is racism. Almost everyone in America has seen at least one image of black bodies being thrown to the ground. Is it the racist jokes or the many photos of jails filled with black bodies? People have been deluged by stories and images meant to convince them that black men are dangerous, black women are dispensable, and black bodies are worth less than white bodies. These messages are in the air, and there is barely anything being done about it. Numerous countries are poisoned by racism. Admitting to being poisoned by racism is not a moral failing, but denying it certainly is. And the poison can't be flushed out until everyone starts thinking about racism like they think about misogyny. Until racism is not just considered a personal moral failing, but as the air everyone has been breathing. The world needs a detox. Detoxing from racism requires you to open your eyes to the elaborate web of white supremacy that exists to convince you that you are better than people of color. In America, there are three kinds of people. Those poisoned by racism and actively choosing to spread it those poisoned by racism and actively trying to detox, those poisoned by racism who deny its very existence inside them. Everyone is poisoned by racism. Dealing with it makes sure of that. Racism today is a very sensitive issue. It's even more complicated for whites. For every white who chooses to show up to speak about racism, people spot an inner racism on the outside by what they say or don't say. But every white person should show up and tell the truth because it's their duty as a member of the human family. Speak your truth, even if you're going to have your racism called out. Accept that others will disagree with how you're showing up. Accept that people will have every right to disagree and learn to withstand their anger knowing that much of it is real and true and necessary. Being called a racist is actually not the worst thing. The worst thing is privately hiding your racism to stay safe, liked and comfortable, while others suffer and die. There are worse things than being criticized, like being a coward. Conclusion now that you have learned how to unapologetically be yourself and help others do the same by contributing your iota to a reasonable world, you can stop looking at what's in front of you long enough to discover what's inside of you. Now that you've been taught how to live up to the full extent of your vision, you can remember and unleash the life-changing and world-changing power of your own imagination. You have almost all you need to work out your freedom, complete it with a determination to act. Give your life a taste of change by connecting to your knowing. Extend this revolution to other aspects of your life, your family, your workplace, your religion, and your relationships. Break down the old walls and rebuild a new life of freedom and peace. It might take a lifetime. Luckily, a lifetime is exactly how long you have. Lose yourself in your imaginations and refuel yourself thinking up to the truest, most beautiful life you can imagine, the truest, most beautiful family you can fathom, the truest, most beautiful world you can hope for. Do not consider them to be pipe dreams. See them as marching orders. See them as the blueprints of your life, your family, and the world. May the invisible order become visible. May your dreams become plans. Try this. Do not let your imagination go to waste. Put all of your wildest dreams on paper. This will help keep you on track and remind you to make conscious efforts to build that world you want. <laughs>